Hello, and you're listening to Free the Mythology, the show where we promote personal creativity by examining works in the public domain and putting new spins on them for storytellers like you. As these works are in the public domain, all the ideas generated from them can be considered Creative Commons 1.0 materials for your use. As we do occasionally reference copyrighted works, please make sure to do your own research before publication. Imaginations of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your canon. And with that, hello and welcome to another episode of Free the Mythology. This is episode 7, but you're probably going to hear it a lot sooner. Uh, I am Melody Wheeler. And I'm Mike Toussaint. And today, um, if you're listening, uh, we're going to ask that you go ahead and if you haven't yet, uh, you know, listened to some black voices like you to go and try to do that i've heard black chit chick lit is pretty good for mm-hmm. uh, literature sources and things um because right now uh the country's in a in a bad place as far as uh racial equality and justice and it needs to be addressed first so uh if you're if you if you have something better to do like write your senators and uh your representatives and call on your local government and otherwise try to get the attention of the people in power to start making the right choices please do that first but if you've done all that and you need maybe a break or maybe a little inspiration so mike Mm -hmm. you know what you got today we, we hmm. know that you're excited about what we got hmm. today. <laughs> Are you ready to talk about I, uh, what we got today? I, I, I think I am. I, I'm perhaps more than ready. Um, so some rest- I'm going to try and exercise as much restraint as possible. This may or may not succeed. Um, yep. This is, this is a big one, folks. Yes. Just letting you know right now, this is a big one. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's pretty pretty current to what's kind of going on. Well, it will never not be. Of- what it, it will never be. not be <laughs> it will never not be yes and uh yeah so so but it's a big one and i'm on a length level the, this is a this is a big thing we biggest. had to pregame a little bit of stuff in here and kind of right ahead of time just yeah. to get the ball rolling because if we started uh with this just fresh we would be in definite trouble so it, it is it, it is quite the work do I we mean, need it a... five volumes um, 48 books, 365 chapters. The edition I have is 1,463 pages. Ooh. Eclipsing even Moby Dick, uh, perhaps. Uh, it, in many, in certain ways. Ladies and gentlemen, do you hear the people saying, we are talking about Victor Hugo's Les Miserables? Right. Okay, I really feel we need to start with that quote. That quote was so powerful. I've I've got it right here, if you'd like. Um, So long as there shall exist, by reason of law and custom, a social condemnation which, in the midst of civilization, artificially creates a hell on earth, and complicates a human with human fatality, a destiny that is divine. So long as the three problems of the century, the degradation of man by the exploitation of his labor, the ruin of woman by starvation, and the atrophy of childhood by physical and spiritual night, are not solved, so long as, in certain regions, social asphyxia shall be possible. In other words, and from a still broader point of view, so long as ignorance and misery remain on earth, there should be a need for books such as this. Yeah. Victor Hugo, Hoville House, 1862. Sorry, I had to just sit a moment. It's, it's a strong thing. And I mean, this podcast is all about storytelling, liberating your storytelling for, for joy, for life, but also it's power right now we're watching as uh america specifically for those who are not in america Mm -hmm. uh our nation is telling stories and we have two very different stories in in conflict and the thing is is that 
we need to be able to get people to see the story that is and the story that can be for us to move on from this until until they can see a different way they're going to still be blind sometimes the store a story can change what you think is possible in the world yes i to go on on a side which is perhaps on point for this um oftentimes when people are debating about fictional works of various sorts a lot of times they will try and undercut themselves undercut their arguments try and cool things down by saying oh it's not like this matters it's not like this isn't important at all which aside from the point that half the time they just say that to try and make themselves look less foolish if they lose the argument mm. um i've always considered that a very poor thing to do like there are things more important there are other things that definitely have greater importance than this greater emer urgency but the imagination is important the stories we tell are important and you should never feel ashamed of that you should never feel like you should cut yourself off from one of the more powerful weapons we have that's yeah and in some ways this this story this big expansive all-encompassing story is a is a good example of firing the imagination as one would a and, cannon and i'll say like this is a story that the way Victor Hugo crafted it was like a mad scientist in a bunker trying to create his mm -hmm. weapon of, like, peace and justice uh, from, from his secret, like, bunker mountaintop with also some, like, travel and other things in there. Um, it's, it's pretty epic just how it kind of comes together, almost as much as the story itself is an epic. I'm going to... I'm going to read mm -hmm. this summary now because yep, yep. it's it's one of those things of this is a big story and it can you can get yes. lost very easily so I'm going to give you the easy sum up. So our main character goes from criminal to like mayor of a town when his past catch up with him he goes from being mayor of a town to a father on the run from the law. Mm -hmm. And in kind of our last act, this father on the run from the law does everything he can to set up his daughter uh, to, to, to survive and have a good life. And then dies, like, with his virtue and his goodness intact. That, yes. is, that is essentially the journey we're going on. Yeah. Okay, now, Mike, you know you're excited? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Let's, let's yes. pull the trigger. Let's let's crack this story. Okay. All right. Let's see. So, oh, it's hard to say where to start. I will just point out that a lot of this book is aside. In that same way with, with Moby Dick, you know, we kept stopping to talk about whales and boats and all that. Victor Hugo does that in more for the entire world. Like, the very beginning lets you know that in 1815, this particular person was a bishop. Now, this doesn't concern our story, but for the purposes of accuracy, we should tell you about his past. What then follows, we, we're one paragraph in, we've begun our first aside, it will go on for 50 pages before we actually meet our main character. <laughs> 50 pages just to let you know that this bishop is a really, really good oh, person. Oh my goodness. <laughs> set up yeah. and that that continues in in large amounts and small amounts through throughout the book um little things i mean occasionally there'll be a chapter just called parenthesis to let you know it's not important and he'll go into the history of convents um <sighs> and so on forth. The, all that's lacking is a moment that's so incredibly on the nose as you have like a squirrel run out and then spend three pages talking about the dignity of the squirrel <laughs> um <laughs> But, but almost all of these, there's a reason for it. Like, he wants to just make sure you have a picture painted of the world. I mean, even even showing the priest, there's a little bit of trying to show what France looks like here in this province in 1815 to give you a little bit sense of, you know, what it's been through to remind you that the revolution and all of that was a thing. I mean, the other most famous break is a little bit further, just when he's about to go from mayor to father on the run we suddenly drop everything to spend 60 pages talking about the battle of waterloo yeah i mean in a in a certain Which... sense it almost feels like he was future proofing the story to be like 
even if we're you're in like hmm. a space gondola, uh, <laughs> you know, or in a completely yeah. foreign country who knows nothing of what France is, you could read this book and suddenly yeah. be able to go, Eureka, I understand what this is. Yeah. But, um, okay, to try and do this is better. All right, so I'm trying my best to not get caught in the weeds. Otherwise, you're going to have to start tasering me. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try and bring so you back I'm, I'm trying to keep focus this on, on character-wise. So you have, you have your main character, Jean Valjean. Now, he is very much a heroic figure in a lot of ways. He has incredible strength. This is shown on multiple occasions that he's able to just do feats of strength that are unprecedented. He also has a very good mind for things. Um... But his, his upbringing is, like, this is, this story is full of sentimentality to the fullest. Like, there's very, a lot of, like, archetypal stuff. There's a whole lot of, like, tearing at the heart. Um, Valjean is born poor. Um, he's raised by his older widowed sister who herself has seven children. He does what he can to support them, any odd job he can find. But then one winter, they're out of money. They have nothing. So he breaks a window and steals a loaf of bread. And immediately gets run down, captured, and hauled off to five years in prison for stealing. Yep. And um, and there's a certain kind of commentator who would insist that he's no angel because he kept trying to escape. Um, and he does make escape attempt after escape attempt uh, with the help of other prisoners. Um, and so that five years blossoms into nineteen years before he's finally released. And, you know, we show him just out on the streets, trying to find shelter because he's a criminal, because, you know, there's not open travel. He has to go with his passport that shows he is a a former convict. He has to keep reporting into people, let him know he's there. Nobody will give him shelter because of that passport. You know, he has money, but nobody cares. Nobody will give him any sort of aid and comfort. So he ends up at the, and, and he himself sees himself as a lowly criminal because that is all the world sees him as. So he ends up at the house of that bishop. He's sheltered. And then he steals the bishop blind. Takes everything. The next day, he's caught. They bring him back to the bishop. And the bishop says, oh, oh no, 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 no. He he grabbed all. He I gave those to him. In fact, I'm glad you brought him back. He forgot the silver candlesticks. And he goes in, gives Valjean the candlesticks, and says, you know, use this to purchase a good life. I have bought back your soul. And there, we spent a lot of time on inner monologue and inner conflict and all that, which oddly enough worked well for the musical adaptation because you can then turn that into a, a song soliloquy. Um, but he he is tortured with us for a bit. But then we skip ahead a few years to find that he he did in fact do that. He built a good life for himself and for other people. He, as it turns out, he's got an entrepreneurial spirit. He can put factories together and all that. He can employ different people, and so that that gives you an idea of that. Which brings us to our next important character. Javert. Javert is the perfect servant of authority. The perfect... I, okay, there's this great line in there of, in the countryside, there's an old wives' tale saying that when a litter of wolves is born, a mother will eat one of them for fear that that one would grow up to devour the others. That wolf in human form would be Javert. Jesus! Yeah. <laughs> um... Javert was born in prison. And he and so he is because of that, because of that stigma, he's grown up despising criminals and being like blindly devoted to authority of all sorts. He became a prison guard and then afterwards became an inspector. Yes, others merely yeah. adopted the darkness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Not bad, not bad. Um <sighs> But so and one of the and and those time as prison, one of the people who's in charge at some point was Valjean. And I can't remember in the book what the original feat of strength is. Because it's, um, it's not the one portrayed in the musical. Like, they conflate a couple of scenes together. I, I can't remember. But, um, but basically, Javert ends up as an inspector in this town. And when a cart falls upon one of the people there, Valjean, even knowing that a guy he remembers from his prison days is there looking at him, can't help himself he goes and like lifts the cart up in a way that no other man could so that you know the Javert suspicion intensifies um 
And this continues on, like he's unable to, lawbreakers are lawbreakers. And as far as the world's concerned, Valjean is still, you know, a fugitive. He, he broke parole. He disappeared. And from the sounds of it, even if the priest insists otherwise, they're pretty sure he stole a bishop's stuff. Um, and so this, now, all right, so that, that's another person who will be dogged. The next one we introduce, poor Fantine. Our, our first, oh, our, our first okay. suffering woman. Um, she, she was a working girl in Paris with her friends. Like her friends, she ended up as the mistress of someone in the, you know, the upper class. And things were fine for a couple of years. They even had a child until this, you know, this upper class guy decided, you know what? It's time to be married. Eh, I could keep my mistress. Yeah, no, nah, I'm not gonna. Bye. And was out of her life. Um, so she ends up, you know, so she... She fosters her, her child off to um, another character we will talk about, the perfectly good and upstanding citizen, Thenadir. Um, this will come up later. It goes to work in this far-off district where, where uh, Valjean's running the factory. Unfortunately, one of Valjean's managers, because there's a whole lot of gossip going on, one of his managers finds out that she has a child out of wedlock, and thus that just won't do. That is terrible, and they fire her. And there's this immediate spiral as her health gets worse, as as she's finding out from the Thenadiers that her daughter is getting worse and worse, and so needs more and more money to be supported for the doctors. Um, and so she she ends up very 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 miserable downward spiral of having to sell off everything she can, getting sicker and sicker. She even attempts to prostitute herself. The guy, the guy she she attempts to solicit basically just gets in her face giving her crap ridiculing her she slaps him and he's all whoa what was it no arrest her and javert being a jackass is like oh yeah i totally should do that valjean steps in big argument starting to get caught up in the weeds trying not to um oh no no but i mean so yeah so fantine <laughs> after this it's it, it, it does get a little confusing. There's there are so many things that go on, on. Not a short story. And there are a lot of coincidental said. meetings. And Essentially. Like, we, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I was just going to say. So Fantine's, Fantine's fate and how this goes. Very mm -hmm. short changes. Uh, Jean Valjean, being a mayor at this point, is able to save her from Javert. Gets her out of the way, but she's already mm -hmm. sick and dying. And basically kind of charges him with taking care mm -hmm. of her daughter set yeah um, yeah we, before she's yes before she and she it. you know we, we make sure to let everyone know that she's buried in the potter's field the common grave of everyone yeah um meanwhile mm -hmm. before valjean can even start doing any of this javert comes to him and says so i thought you were this criminal uh turns out i was wrong we caught him jean valjean's been caught uh, he's claiming that he's an, he's an idiot who just doesn't understand things, but it's totally him. I know. Don't worry, sir. You're cl you're you're the mayor. You're an authority figure. You would never do anything wrong. Um, Valjean is, of course, immediately conflicted by this idea of goes back and forth of should I, and, and eventually makes the decision to go to the go to the trial of this man who isn't him. Admit that he is Jean Valjean and all of that. This ends up putting him back on the run. In this is cut in some adaptations, but he um he does briefly get captured again, and the the feat of strength that I think a lot of people are familiar with involving like a, an accident on shipboard happens then. Like he saves a man's life there. Everyone stands mm. starts chanting "Free this man." He realizes that will never happen, so he just sort of falls overboard to fake his death. Mm. And, and of course, makes it to swim to shore safely because, of course, he does. Have you seen that man's upper body strength? Um. <laughs> So then he, he, he pulling the boat behind it now. <laughs> yes, darn near. Um, so then he goes to find now to find the daughter, and now we meet our next character, Thenadir. Thenadir is greed incarnate, because we get there and you have this very nice little inn, and Thenadir Thenadir's children have everything they would possibly need. They are being utterly spoiled, and then there's this girl that he he is you know. He's warding, you know, Fantine's daughter, who is their servant, dressing in rags, doing all of the chores and all of that sort of thing. That is that is the cover image, the the sad little girl in rags. That is the, that's the central image of the whole thing. And then the daughter, that's C Cassette, 
I feel like I'm always mispronouncing everyone's name in this we'll, book. We'll, I will throw we'll that out there. But, um, not too much right now. Apologies to yeah, the French-speaking yeah. people out there. We're doing our best. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that that's our, our next figure, Cassette, is, who will be his adopted daughter. Um, now, in this confrontation, there there is no righteous fury, no changing out of the money cha- changes. He doesn't beat them all up. Um, there's no real comeuppance. It is... It, it is... Uh, he says, I would like to take care of that child. And Thanagar says, no, 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 I would never do it unless you gave me a lot of money. Maybe that would do it. And it, he just does just throw money at him, take the girl and leave. Um, yeah. Making the greedy little bastard quite happy. Um, now, I will point out, by this point, we um, remember that aside about the Battle of Waterloo? That happened before this. <laughs> and the, the, the re... Yeah, the, but like basically when, when Valjean disappears... We suddenly drift to, I visited Waterloo last year. Let me tell you all about it. Just long rant about, and the bravery of the last man standing there. Um, I will get caught up because this is one of my favorite scenes, but it's not important to the story, so I will not go on it here. Just know that I am one of the people who will defend this particular okay. aside to the death. Um, but after, after, after Hugo's almost done with it, in the last bit of it, he talks about a colonel dying on the ground and how this, this little little bastard was coming along looting all of the corpses and one of them the colonel wasn't quite dead and made the mistake of thinking that thenadir the looter saved his life that's the first time we meet thenadir and this little story will come up later of course because there's all that sort of thing so so yeah so valjean and cassette go on the run they are very much they're they're a good loving father and daughter right away they end up in paris and they sh- and Javert is on their tail still. He doesn't believe in the fake death thing, um, but things work out for him. Remember, uh, there was that overturned cart that he he was able to save. That man ended up a gardener in a little con, I think, convent mm, yeah. in in Paris. He takes them in, and so and so he be you know. They rebuild their life there. She she begins to go to school. He still has access to he he managed to get some of the mayor his mayoral money from when he ran the factory. All so that he sweet still has mayor access money. to all of it. Yeah, he still has access to all of his funds, um, which just adds to Valjean's legacies because now everyone because there's incredible confusion about what happened. Um, everyone just thinks that he forged signatures and stole money from the mayor of this town. <sighs> yeah, but he but he crafts a new identity and everything is peaceful for eight years. All right, now the, at this point we meet like the last Im, the last two of the important iconic characters. One of whom we've already met, but it's at this point she becomes important. Is like the, our first one we have talked about is Marius, the aristocrat. Because we are now we are now it we started in eighteen fifteen. We're now in eighteen thirty two. Like a lot of time has passed. Um. The, we have changed from one monarchical dynasty to another, but things still aren't that great. There is unrest in the land. A revolt is brewing uh, because of an epidemic going around. An epidemic of an uh. epidemic of cholera, which is, of course, cholera being waterborne, is linked to the fact that the poor have access to very poor quality water, and the rich don't seem to care about that. I'm sure none of that is, you know. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Certainly not relevant to the current year, time, place, date. It mm-hmm. is 2020. But, uh, but yeah, <laughs> so... Yeah, oh, so Marius is from... Well, his grandfather is a staunch royalist, believe in all that. His father um, was that... Served with Bonaparte, in fact, was that colonel. Um, originally, Marius was more like his grandfather, but over time became a rev- has become more and more of a revolutionary, a republican, or as you might put it. Um, and, hmm. and so his father passed away, but let him know about this Thenadir guy that saved his life. So, so hmm. he is, he is working with, you know, the growing you know, protest movement that is planning a big organization at some point in the future. Uh, now in the, in this meanwhile, the Thenadirs in these eight years lost their inn and moved to Paris and are living in like squal- in squalid conditions and are and have just devolved into just thieves and beggars. Um, the, the, their son is good natured and like is out on his own away from them and is actually working with the uh, the, pro, the the more the, the rebellious sorts. Um, but the the most important right. part of the children is the eldest daughter Eponine. 
Um, Eponine is very much... Basically, Marius just happens to live next door to them. And so Thenadir basically attempts to... Tells his daughter to pimp herself out to Marius. Um, and... Yeah. Which is, I mean, Eponine does in fact fall in love with, with him. He, not so much. He He has a... He has a chance run in with uh, Cassette, at which point he actually asks Eponine's help in finding her in the uh. ultimate uh, ducky moment. Um, there, in the in the book, there's there's a crazy incident involving like a gang of thieves when they try to kidnap Valjean by inviting him to the because as fate would have it, Valjean now being you know wealthy again is trying to help as many people as he can. So the Thenadiers just happened to petition him for, for aid before realizing, wait a minute, I know that guy. He's the one that took a set mm. and, and things, you know, devolved from there. At, at the same time, when Marius hears about all this going down and he runs to the police for help, of course, the police officer he finds is Javert, pulling him back into everything. Like, somehow we, we avoid immediate disaster, but then basically the, the next couple months are like, this sort of growing tension as Marius and Cassette fall in love, as the Thenadiers get sent to prison, break out of prison, and try to figure out what their next scheme is, as Eponine tries to contrive things so that she can be, you know, with Marius, uh, as Javert is, you know, starts infiltrating the rebel movement to try and, you know, on orders from above, and this, this, all of this crazy back and forth, as Valjean tries to decide how much he can reveal of his past to, to Cassette and to her, her new, you know, lover to be. And this all comes to a head during the big protest. The, uh, I can't remember if it's called the student revolt or not, but after one of the few figures in government, kind to the poor, died of cholera, at his funeral, there was a massive protest that re resulted in, you know, rioting and looting and barricades in the streets and people shooting each other and all of that sort of thing. In fact, one of the heaviest criticisms leveled against Hugo was people saying the, I just, I don't know if I like the way in which he, he seems to express sympathy towards anyone who would plan a riot. Mm-hmm, yeah. Which, you know, yeah. again, is a strange Weird. alien mindset. Um, yeah. Um, but to... To sum up the craziness as best I can, Valjean saves Javert when he gets discovered to being an undercover cop. P pretends to execute him, but doesn't. This causes a major ethical crisis in Javert that he cannot resolve and ends up killing himself, throwing himself into the river. Um, Valjean goes to the barricades and basically drags the wounded and unconscious Marius away from the trouble as everyone else is overrun and killed. Um, going through the sewers, accidentally getting some help from Thenadir, like, gets him, gets him home to be, to be cured and all that. Um, not long after that, after the troubles all end, him and Cassette do get married. He reveals that he is his criminal background. And it's like, I'm this guy, here's my record. He does not quite get around to explaining any details of it because he doesn't feel that's fair. And Marius, as it turns out, well, it's hard to put past all those societal, um, you know, prejudices about this being a criminal. And, like, tells him to get out Listen, of their lives. Listen, it's one thing for me to think the poor deserve things, but you've committed a crime? My word! Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, ba ba basically, basically. And then, and then, after this, Thenadir comes to blackmail him because he knows things about, you know, his his new wife's father. Mm. Um, and even though, and Marius already knows this, he thinks, but in his, in his, like, in his urgency to prove that he's smarter and that he knows something that, that Marius doesn't, he accidentally reveals the truth about everything, therefore pointing out that, that uh, Valjean is actually a really good person. <laughs> That's like, no, no, he didn't steal the mayor's money. He is the mayor. He just, you know, he built a... I mean, he didn't steal from the priest. The priest gave him all that stuff. <laughs> I mean, and, and and he was, but but you know what? He was lurking around the sewers the other day. He he had this he had this body over his shoulders, and I was like, wait a minute, he's the guy who saved my life. I uh um n n no no that wasn't him. Um, so Marius realizes I've made a terrible mistake. He's actually a really good person. I I should check my privilege, maybe. Um, <clears throat> So he, he tells Checking Thenadir, privilege you know what, you since want... the 1800s, folks. If they can do it in a novel, <laughs> you can do it too. Anyhow, 
Continue. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he tells the narrator, you know what? You want money. You can have it. I will give you passage out of the country. I will give you 20,000 francs. Never come back to France. And um, and just to get um, to give the punchline here, well, I mean, some people given that much money could change their lives. He didn't. He was far too full of greed. So he went to New York and became a slave trader. Ah! <laughs> okay. I mean, it's that double thing of, yes, he's just the worst, but also that level of the, what, pl- what kind of nation would appreciate a man this horrible? Uh, okay. Okay. Anyway, no, anyway, it's, so... It's fine. But, but, but uh, you have this last scene where, where Marius and Cassette go to, to see Valjean, who is... Who, being old at this point, is is dying, um, but that everything everything is righted at the end. He he get, he talks to them a bit about about Fantine, about his background and all that. Um, there's this line where the doctor attending to him asks if he wants a priest, and he says, "It's all right. There's one already here." And he kind of looks up in the sense as if the bishop was there, um, and he just says, "Just bur- bury me in the field in an unmarked grave." And there's there's this sense that like you know Fantine and, and the bishop are there, and we have this last little bit talking about how in a graveyard in Paris. Uh, in this little overgrown spot that people don't walk in because it tends to get damp whenever there's rain, there there is a little grave with a white stone marking it with nothing written, written on it. it. Originally, originally, originally something, something was written in pencil, pencil but uh, due to the wishes of the, of the deceased, it, it was just pencil, so it would wear off over time. It has, but but the verse originally was, and it it's just a a little rhyming couplet, just uh, translated as he is asleep, though his metal was sorely tried. He lived, and when he lost his angel, died. It happened calmly, on its own, the way night comes when day is done. A calm, quiet end to a fairly crazy life and story. Yeah. Ooh. Okay, how bad I do that? Ah, not as no, bad no, as I no, thought. No, no, was... no, not, not so bad at all. We got through all of it. And yeah. And that even included it... a little bit of the asides, at least acknowledging they exist. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, and there is... Like I said, it is big and expansive. You see a lot more of, of these characters and a lot more of a lot other characters too. But these are I, I tried to hit the the ones who are very archetypal, who are the ones you can play I, around I, I with. I think you it's... I think you did that beautifully. Yeah. Um and as far as the whole archetypal kind of nature of the characters that was something when, when we were kind of reviewing, because like we said, this thing is gigantic, mm-hmm. like trying to do it all in one go without being prepared. Would have been a yeah, I mean, even reading this, I've, I have read this once, by which I mean I would basically read one of the five parts at a time and then put it down for like months or years at a time. It probably took me like four or five years all told to get through my read. Wow. But it, it remains one of those books, there's a handful of books that I can just sort of occasionally idly pick up turn to a random page and I will spend an hour just reading from that point. So and it, that's definitely one of those for me. Um, again, with that, I, I have read the part about Waterloo way too many times just because of incredible excitement about the end of it. But that, that that's a story for another yeah. day. Not for this podcast. So, just a, if, if, if you ever catch me in a mood where I've had a couple to drink, ask me about it and you'll get it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so getting, getting to the like theme, the meat of this story, mm-hmm. um, there's, there's like a couple things that is not uncomplicated because it's massive, yeah. but a lot of ways it's it's a story of, I would almost call it an ironic story mm-hmm. of redemption because you have a character whose road to redemption, him being a criminal and going on and on and on, becoming this, this good person who does all these good things in his life. Um, in many ways, he never started as a bad person. Yeah. So I guess the irony is it's one of those, this is the person who in many ways he was all along before the world tried to make him into something else and insisted on it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll point out la- in our, our last episode, which uh, those listening may or may not have heard by this point, there was some discussion about the fact that people talk about, you know, it's when you have nothing, you learn who you truly are, but maybe it's more about when you have things you learn. This is a great example of that, that reverse. It of is. What, what is it, you know, and especially when you look at how it's bookended with uh, these two very different people receiving money. It's like, well, what do you do when you have, you know, the ability to yeah. be someone? And that, and that I think, spell out a lot more about someone's virtue than uh, taking everything away. 
definitely. Um, the, the other thing being is, is this whole story just highlights the plight of the powerless. Like, mm -hmm. just how bad things get in our society from the various unnecessary cruelties done to people. Yeah. And a lot uh, unnecessary and in a lot of cases unconscious. I mean, sometimes conscious, sometimes very conscious, but other times people don't even seem to realize. Yeah. I mean, even, um, even Valjean, I mean, he... Fantine is fired from his factory without him even knowing this happened. Yeah. Yeah, like, and that's, and I think that's worth it too, just the whole thing of, you know, some things go bad due to just mishap and lack of knowledge. I mean, heck, even in this, it occurs to me, the one thing I forgot is that, you know, Eponine has been overlooked. I forgot to mention yeah, her tragic end, which is almost kind of correct, oh. which is, uh, I should let you know, poor Eponine does end up at, at the barricades as well and gives her life to save Marius and confesses yeah. her love to him that everyone in the audience already knew about um, as she dies. <sighs> yeah. Oh, okay, I, I watched the musical like yesterday mm. and I cried at least three times during it. Mm. Um, as I was saying, it is, it is a sad story even if it is a very good story. Mm -hmm. It definitely has some very sad parts. Oh yeah. Very much um, on purpose. I mean, it's it's called The Miserable. Yeah. yeah. Or the so, wretched, the meek. There's a lot of ways you could translate that. But. Yeah, there's a lot of different translations. Although I think that's the closest well, spelling-wise, yes. so therefore it's the mm -hmm. most used. So, uh, uh, getting on to, to kind of doing spins on this a little bit. The the, the thing we kind of tried to... We always try to identify out an angle, which you can hit a story from that's mm -hmm. useful. And I think for this story, because it is so sprawling and so massive, and you may not have the energy to do the huge, the massive, mm -hmm. uh, the thing that you can really take away is powerful archetypes as characters. Yes. Um, so, Jean Valjean essentially becomes, like, um, he's the golden-hearted criminal. Yes. Um, the kindness he is given becomes him in a lot of ways yes and you reviewing this made me very much realize Venadir is his like evil opposite yeah is definitely the venom to his spider-man because yeah. <clears throat> they, they have very similar circumstances in many ways so you you get this whole thing of like you know jean valjean uh saves marius saves the father but not hmm. really he's there to just like poach oh. off of him they're both father yep. figures they both our guardians to cassette at mm -hmm. some point and it, it's essentially they're both given the same chances and while john valjean keeps choosing higher roads mm. then a deer literally right to his end is yeah. a black-hearted villain he is an mm -hmm. awful freaking human being yeah in every sense of it and, and I, think... I don't know what's being said there beyond the fact that some people are just bad but I guess it is worth saying that sometimes you can't get some people to become good. Yeah. That's a rough lesson. Mm -hmm. That's a rough one. It, it, it is tough. And it, I think it's honestly important for this story that it's like he never gets any sort of comeuppance. Because like this is, most adaptations try to undercut this in some ways. The the, the, the 90s version, um, the scene in which he's gotten you, you know, he, he keeps saying, oh, I, w I would never take money for her. I could, you know, it, it just wouldn't be appropriate. And he keeps saying larger and larger amounts as as Valjean takes more and more money out of his pocket. But then the last thing he pulls out is just the note saying that he's he is now Cassette's guardian, so they get nothing. It's like, no, 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 that, that doesn't happen that way. That then they just get money. Or even in the musical where, yeah. like, Marius at least beats the tar out of uh, the Yeah, like, no. yeah. Like, like it's, we, it's one of those things of they exit stage left and that's the last you hear of them. You don't yeah. hear about how bad it gets when it's yeah. like oh yeah he has money now and he's gonna do something awful with it yeah it hurts and i think it's kind of meant to hurt yeah well even i mean his introduction is there's this whole little discussion about how you know now that we've talked about this battle we've had this long discussion about it but now there's scavengers and there's that little talk about like camp followers and battlefield looters and all that it's like the there's 
There's, even at yeah. these even at these big things we that have all these conflicting emotions about them, there's still there's these there's these other things in the shadows that yeah. sort of probably happened for a reason, and what happens next is hard to say. So anyhow, it's yeah. getting back to these archetypes. Right, right. Yes, yes. Yep. It's like I said, but it is useful to say this is this is a role being played in the show, story to show that mm. there there are two paths. Yep. Um, we have uh, an archetype that is essentially uh, kindness personified with the uh, mm-hmm. the bishop character who yeah. quite literally damn near gives all his treasures to someone just to give them a chance at being a decent person and it works yeah and and we never see him again but there's almost this sense of like the kindness keeps keeps building there's that sense of the kindness repaying kindness as we go along like other people like the fact that the guy that Valjean saves ends up saving him later and little things like that all throughout. So that even though the bishop is not on screen again, he's still very much in Valjean's thoughts and there's, almost there's overseeing of, what comes next. There's a lot of goodness repaying goodness and self-sacrifice and things mm-hmm. like that going on. Yeah. Um, Javert is just the face of ruthless authority. Yes. It is an unreasoning, unswerving, mm-hmm. like, like such commitment to the law with no regard as to what the law is meant to do. Which ultimately, if the law is not serving people, then it needs to be revised, right? Yeah, I mean, it intriguingly the before he kills himself, his suicide note is specifically just a small essay talking about how conditions in prisons are a bit inhumane <laughs> but but yeah like the fact that like as i said he is born in prison which is just this great uh, like like thing to say but it's just because of how it sets him up but also just he was born in prison that's a, he's yeah. never really left the prison yeah no that's uh that's definitely totally a uh a thing. I, I mean, he's he's born in prison, and I think in a way we that metaphorical level of prison in many ways is his mind, and it's his slavishness to this mm-hmm. system that imprisons others. Like he is in many ways the living prison, walking around and putting people into chains without thought towards why. Yeah, just that it is right because it is because he was told it's right, and it's that circular logic thing, and it's it's not very good. Um. Another archetype here we have is very unfortunately seen many times mm-hmm. the the abused woman yeah. because we we see this time and again and it's you know what happens with Fantine is very heartbreaking what happens with Epony is equally heartbreaking mm-hmm. and there's a lot of parallel in the kind of yeah like all person three of these, they both tend to be yeah there's there's a lot of very interesting and obviously deliberate parallels between all three women. I mean, you know, because it's, you know, because Fantine was originally just the mistress of someone, you know, upper class, and Eponine is being set up by her father to be in that position, even as she clearly mm-hmm. wants for more. And there's when uh, when Marius first takes the cassette to his grandfather, who he hasn't been on speaking terms for a while, his grandfather at some point flat out says she'd be way better as a mistress than a wife, and it's just... Mm. So, yeah. So this this thing, and so I'd I'd say in another so there's there's the archetype of the 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 abused woman because mm-hmm. it, it keeps being a thing, and then I think past that we get towards um uh, as a, as an archetype privilege itself, mm-hmm. and 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 so we have throughout you know like privileged characters act in ways inhumane um. And, and even when they're trying to be good, they don't always have. There's they're sometimes ignorant. Yeah. And so like I think I think Marius is like our our, our main one on that. But then you see the father. You see how you know like the mistress mistress thing. It's like yeah, there are privileged people who see women as nothing more than something to be used. And that that is that comes across. Mm-hmm. pretty Multiple strong times. yeah like and it's i think it's really kind of cool too that when jean valjean has created his business it is women mm-hmm. working there 
because that to me it it it's it's kind of one of those huh women don't always get jobs and this is a person who is supplying them in a time where that wasn't always the standard yeah. and that's that whole thing of while under his care they were able to work yeah. supply for themselves and have their own personal dignity yeah. and, plus, and in... once that's removed she mm-hmm. immediately falls basically in the gutter fending for herself yeah. and i mean and fairly humane conditions for a factory work at the time like he is the last he ever hears of his family is his sister living in Paris, having to work like 14 hours a day um, with only one of the seven children still with her. Like, he hears this story at like the four-year mark, uh, which prompts his first breakout, and he never hears anything more from his family again. Um, wow. And so I imagine, I didn't really think about it ever until just now, that it's like, that probably factors into a lot of his, you know, the way he builds the factory and such. Probably. So okay, uh, let's let's try to get into spins now. I think okay. we've we've covered some of the big archetypes that you can use. But having these big archetypes, because while it's a very realistic story in many ways, the circumstance, the 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 um the serendipitous yeah. meeting of the same people again yep. and again, despite changing over time and area, mm-hmm. it it's a little it, like I, I'm trying not to this isn't a knock on it it's a little unrealistic yeah like in fact in some ways bumping into each other in some ways all of the asides like he's trying to build as much grounded reality as possible to try and sort of soften the blow of that like heightened story sense i guess you'd say of these characters continuing to be in each other's lives but but that being said these archetypes i think because of being so archetypal Mm -hmm. that's why they carry so much power with them because you're you're essentially having a lens to see through to see the these kind of circumstances like as much as maybe one person does not live a Jean Valjean life all the bits and pieces are built out of real life just usually don't form into just one person um so yeah I, I do think that carries a power um so on to, on to the spins mm-hmm so the first note I want to say on this is that uh, the best story you could probably do is not a story I think either of us are really equipped to tell super well. Right. Which would be retellings in the modern era. Yeah. And such. Um, in some ways, any 17-year slice, like, from 17 years ago to now, or anything else across the 20th and 21st century in a lot of ways. Yeah. Like... It could be that it will be needed to be written after our current times. Oh. Um, yes, he. I mean, this was written about 30 years after the revolt that's the climax. Yeah, but... It took him many, many that, years to do it, but that's about when it came out. Yeah. So, the thing is, is that this story is very powerful and it's very relevant. And I feel like right now you like i could write it but i feel as if if i did it would be one of those it wouldn't come out with the necessary resonance to really carry across the themes that i feel are really relevant to now i honestly feel like somebody who is a writer who is marginalized uh like a great deal there's a story there to tell that version of this story because these kinds of books will always be needed hugo is not saying just my book and i'm Mm -hmm. super greedy yeah these kinds of stories there's always going to be a need for stories of people who are unfairly oppressed who are chewed up by society who through their own virtue maybe make the world a little bit better place around them and remind us that you know there are people out there suffering and need help Mm -hmm. and our indifference and our privilege is the reason why they suffer so much so yeah i i just uh, so just as a thing i'm like somebody out there listening to this take what we've got and run with it because you've got a better story in you than than we probably got 
for this. That Depends being like said, that, this, the show is meant to entertain. Mm-hmm. We we gotta we gotta make a few spins. Oh yeah, and there's there are other places you can take this. Um, and some of this resonance will should still echo through. Yeah, but there is more here. There's more going on than just a lecture on the humanities of the world. It is a story, and the story itself is powerful. Yeah, yeah. No, there's definitely something to that. So okay, uh, we'll we'll start this first one. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is our this is our fantasy take, and it is sort of uh, smashing together some some Robin Hood, mm-hmm. with a little bit of Les Miserables. So, um, yeah, we talked about a, about a couple of these things, and it was like, okay, how do we how do we fit these archetypes in? Got some some actual already like okay, cool. Mm-hmm. We've got a lot of the beats can be very similar because yeah. it's a story about outlaws to start. Yep. And about, you know, oppression and unkindness. So they're they're already like meeting up pretty mm-hmm. well. Yeah. And plus it's it, it's ground that's been tread on so many times that it is all the pieces are very, very interchangeable and seasoned to taste in any direction you want already, which makes it ripe for, for working with. Yep. So um my my first instinct and and, and sort of yours too, I think, mm-hmm. when we, we talked about this was that uh our, our Jean Valjean should be john yeah uh, little john found john um mm-hmm. i also very strong oddly <laughs> yes is kind yeah, of fits I mean, these things exactly but, like he is he is one of the two biggest authority figures in it in in some versions of the story he puts together the merry men first um yeah. and he, i he, i think that would be the good viewpoint character mm-hmm. yeah and it's you know this is most of these merry men become out of law because of you know poaching which is again just feeding your family Yep, pretty much right in the same kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think as an idea, the idea of a uh, friar tuck being kind mm-hmm. of the thing that sets them on the more golden-hearted criminal path makes a sort of sense to me. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Kind of going back into that kindness personified kind of archetype. Uh, Sheriff of Nottingham can obviously play out as our ruthless figure of authority because he is the ruthless figure yeah. of authority in the story. Like and already baked in. Um, so the so the ones that are a little more interesting, like difficult, like Robin Hood as the face of of Marius as privilege because it's mm-hmm. it's it's uh he's he's a lord, right? In most versions. Right, so like he is coming from privilege, being like, "I shall join you," or or he's been outlawed in some way still. But there's there's definitely a level of you probably had other options. Yeah, you've chosen to be what you're doing, and so that that very much puts him into the Marius privilege camp. And he might have a really interesting thing too. He may move from being kind of privileged of like this is my weapon to use on the world and then suddenly kind of more realizing oh these are people Mm -hmm. um so you could you could have a pretty good i think transformation of uh ignorant privilege to you know aware privilege yeah the tricky bit is working in the abused woman um because i mean like Maid Marian is kind of the only only character there, I think, for the most part. Is there another woman in the stories? See, there probably is one that I am not aware of. Right. Because, just mean, because there's so many pieces. But in general, she's the only real one. Right. So in a couple of these places, you're going to either have to repurpose a character mm-hmm. or or redo it. My, my favorite idea is having um, the abused woman being one of the merry men, but being actually a woman in disguise. Yeah, there, there's several merry men. Choose, choose the one you like best. I don't know. Yeah. There, there's um, a huge cast. You can grab pretty much any of them. Yep. Um, having a character who is Robin Hood's kind of evil opposite, the greed with legs kind of thing. Not Robin mm-hmm. Hood's Little John's. Yeah. That that's tricky because um, it, it's just just it's just tricky to like work in. But it could still have a point, especially if actually kind of concurrent with like right now i can see it being the whole thing of one of the sheriff's men mm. being uh an agitator he starts they start robbing people who they wouldn't normally rob people who mm. can't afford it 
are excessively violent about it. Like, don't just rob them, kill them. And then it's, oh, look, look what Robin, Robin Hood and those merry men are doing. Look what those criminals are out there doing. Well, it's justified. We use as much force as we want in trying to oppress this. Yeah. Um, and it'd be somebody who just takes the money for it. And maybe they had an outlaw status. It's just they very quickly cut a deal with authority because, well, what's good for me? Meh. I could see that being a way to take it. Um, still not sure like how it all plays out in the end. I mean, it's going to follow the Robin Hood story for the mm-hmm. most part. Uh, I think as far as the abused woman who's the man in disguise, there is a certain kind of like, well, it can look tricky because once you're done being an outlaw, well, the disguise is probably going to come off. Yeah, And when that happens, there's a certain level of, oh my word, you know, like, where do you go? Because, well, you know, her, her endings get limited by the time period of, well, she could get married. Mm-hmm. Mind you, if you do this totally, like, if you lean into the fantasy, you can be like, screw it, she gonna do what she wants. And that's fine. Yeah. Um, season to taste. But mm-hmm. if, you're, if you're leaning into the history side of it. My, my thought was she could either become a spinster or an alewife, somebody who's able to, like, support themselves. They make their own money. Uh, if you don't know spinsters and alewives, basically you could be a, you know, a brewer or you could uh, create cloths and textiles and clothes and things like that. And it was a way to make money. And uh, it was a way to make money as a woman and not be uh, too far outside of societal norms. Although still there was a lot of patriarchal nonsense where they would get on you for that. Um... And I mean, she could also go to a convent or mm-hmm. maybe a noble arrives and just fixes things. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I mean, yes, noble arriving, fixing things, having it turn out, oh, wait, actually, you were the legitimate daughter after all. Yep. Yeah, that is that is entirely a possibility. Um, you know, that that is that is a way to go with it. And I mean, like. And, and it can still follow some of the other like things, too, like little John could die. At oh, the yeah. end. I mean, there are there are a lot of different good and bad endings for this. You you could have Sherwood Forest get overrun. You could have most of the Merry Men get taken out at some point. Yeah. And I mean, and it still would have Robin Hood full of privilege surviving. Mm-hmm. Maybe Little John saving his butt and it yep, being I, one of those. Oh, and then the nobles come I mean, in I, and everything's I, good except it's yep. not what yeah. it is. Honestly, I can immediately see in an inversion of the, the, the I Can't Swim joke from the 90s, I can see just Little John just carrying him through a river to try and get out of the forest. Yeah. So I think there's a story there, if it's if it's one you want to crack. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it plays out fairly close to both all public domain stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's, that's, that's our pseudo fantasy version that's yes. i think as close as we can get to that yeah. so okay. being as robin hood it's easy enough to plop more weird fantasy e-bits in if you need yep you throw in a witch or some mm-hmm. magic robin hood turns into a frog for some reason yeah. maybe they're all animals i don't yeah. know yeah. Yep. do what you Kel- want to do yep. Celts showing up 800 years too late <laughs> some of us never forget uh, i've forgotten I don't even know what you're talking about. That's the nineties Robin Hood again. Oh, okay. Alright, I'll just try and try and forget that as mm. best I can. So, um So next uh, I think we'll we'll try to do the sci fi type take. Mm. Alright. Now here's here's the thing. We gotta yeah. address the fact that you can just do cyberpunk. Yeah. Because e- e- cyberpunk as a genre is pretty much always about abuse of power. Uh, people surviving in a bad system and trying to make a difference and yeah. so in many ways like yeah almost all cyberpunk stories not all but most are going to mm-hmm. follow in a very similar vein and while and you could use um the the main story as a uh as a kind of archetype to build off of you know um, yeah like in some ways you could just do it beat for beat um yeah like like pretty much like you know, there's some things that are slightly different, like Aver might be a cyborg, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Marius might be some sort of bigwig in a, a CEO in a, some sort of mega corporation, uh, Thenadir, asshole hacker. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I love yeah, that his, note. His, yeah, his kids hacker. could be AI. 
just mm. because the idea of Eponine like sacrificing her code is the, the closest to like a, a variation I can think. And yeah, and John Valjean could just be, you know, a prisoner who, who left and, and mm-hmm. maybe pulled a tracking chip out of themselves to be like, no, I'm off the grid now. And then you got a lot of really good techno music and stuff. But oh, you yeah. can pretty much do it point per point. So we're gonna we're gonna sum up that and move on because it doesn't feel like we're really challenging ourselves. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah that. that's fair. Like that writes itself so much though. Yeah, it's a little a little almost boring. So instead mm. we're doing this one with a bit of a space opera feel. Mm. Um and essentially, you know, space opera is interesting because everything scales up. An epic that might take place between countries will take place between planets, you know. Yep. Um, a war that devastated a nation devastates star systems. Like, it's, you know, it just gets bigger because yeah. space is so big. Um, so one of the widgets I wanted to throw in on this is the idea of functional immortality for people. Hmm. Um, you know, I, a little, little transhuman, but not like thinking like the idea of, you know, as long as nothing kills you, you can expect to live essentially hundreds, thousands of years. Mind you, some of that might be not numerous people have hit it. It's just people have stopped mm-hmm. dying from old age. That right. kind of idea. Um, got some other fun notes here. <laughs> so... Yeah, scaling up. Scaling up makes things easy. So instead of John L. John stealing off of bread, he steals like a literal shipment of food. Could be yeah. an entire freighter or ship. Yeah. And, you know, it's not because one person's starving. It's because a colony is starving. Yeah, I mean, out on the fringes, uh, colonies are often, you know, even though way back in the, the central places, like, everything's nice, we don't have to worry about stuff, but, you know, out on the fringes, you're on your own. You sink mm-hmm. or swim based on stuff, so if things are going bad, if somebody misjudged how good the world is you know you might be in trouble nobody will help so there just happens to be this passing uh passing freighter if you can get on it with like a little shuttle throw as much in as you can try and get away before the uh the auto locks shoot you down yeah i like the idea so so you know he'll go to a space mine or something Mm -hmm. like that and since he's functionally immortal, he's there for like a hundred years. Yeah, it's continuous it, continuous escape attempts. I kind of like the idea of it. Continuous tiny violations, micro aggressions, as it were, just like building yeah. his his credit up bit by bit over time. Right, and I kind of I kind of dig the idea of it being like an asteroid mining because I just mm. think asteroid mining is neat. Well, yes. Um. So when they're finally done. It's one of those, okay, uh, I'm sticking with tracking chips. That just seems like a very sci-fi, awful, yeah, authoritarian thing. Uh, the idea you came up with, oh. Javert, <laughs> is one of my favorite things. Mm-hmm. So, rather than being born in a prison, Javert is the prison. Mm-hmm. Like a literal prison ship with and things that goes from planet to planet you know mm-hmm. trying to uh enforce justice in galactic law and as an idea i'm like that's just that's just amazing yeah um I just originally used as idea. a transport for the asteroid miners if again later on repurposed for um expeditions to uh to maintain to remove disorder in colonial areas mm-hmm. so um john valjean after he's finally no longer uh a sp- is forced to space mine is trying to find find his way in a, a cold and and heartless galaxy mm-hmm. and uh ends up at a, a space dock called salvation yeah it's a space station mm-hmm. just this this big just this big dock where there's all sorts of like derelict ships in in not great shape just end up there because they'll the mechanics there will will work for free or for cost or just whatever you can to try and get people's ships back up and running again so you have this somewhere between a space junkyard and, and that area of say hong kong that's mostly like boat ships that sort of feel to it and, and so he so, just sort of drifts and ends up here yeah and so somewhere sometime while he's here he decides to go ahead and, and tries to boost uh, yep. boost his own uh, boat <laughs> yeah, <laughs> slash, yep. slash spaceship to. Uh, I guess it would, it would probably be the uh, 
It'd be the station owner's own personal ship they arrived in, I guess. Probably, yeah. And because there's their... charities probably like staying with the station owner, so it's the closest mm-hmm. vessel to. Yep. And uh, you know, the station owner being our kindness personified, mm-hmm. getting into that archetype, yeah. uh, decides to give him the ship, give him a chance, give him a better life, and. You you said something. I was like, this is a bit... I like this line. Oh. I thought it was oh, yeah. cute. This space is cold. Try to make it a little warmer. Mm. And I'm like, okay. I kind of dig that. Yeah. I kind of dig that one. As a, as a possible line from this character. Mm-hmm. So, he goes out and he terraforms a large part of the planet. And the good thing is, we got functional immortality. So, like, his hundred year prison sentence is now a hundred years later from that. Yep. While he's been just working to get this planet up and running. Um, and, you know, a Space Javert. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the, the flying prison ship. Uh, shows up with all the drones and everything else. And it's like, you know, hello, citizen. We, we've seen that you have created a great deal of terraforming here. We would like to make sure that you are reminded of uh, the presence of the galactic you know civilization that makes this all possible i am here to assist you in maintaining law and order in this place like Mm. very cheerful ai and i'm sure he's probably like changed his face and stuff like that at this point since dealing with a robot you got to be a lot more uh extensive on some things obviously and so um he's uh uncomfortable with the uh presence of uh you know this uh, living prison ship and its drones mm. just being very ever present on the planet suddenly and uh so that now we, we this is this is most i think i just ran through our notes so crack yeah, the story as, further yeah that's as far as we got just because it it was surprised once you started going it was coming out easy now now for fantine you could now, play it straight it, it, yeah it could just be played straight as certain th- certain things about the way people were doing things that was fine mm-hmm. uh before now now that now that we're getting civilized now that the eyes of the uh the galactic civilization are upon us certain things that that used to be fine are no longer permissible so all of a sudden we're even things as little as child out of wedlock is suddenly like uh. i mean we could go that way i would i was almost thinking like can you maybe lean back into the transhuman thing a bit with the Ooh. idea of like oh yeah like fantine well they were they were a genetic augment like they had their dna changed and things and they also had a child and that's one of those no-nos with uh somebody who has genetic augments because there's a lot of worry about genetic drift Mm -hmm. that's supposed to be a one-off yeah yeah like oh if you have a kid who's got genetic drift that's a problem Mm because So that's that's illegal, and it's really looked down on. It's almost like you're a traitor <laughs> to the human race kind of thing. Well, yeah, I mean, it was part of me also says, well, I mean, those genes in your are copyrighted. You're not supposed to copy them without permission. Now, mind you, the the genetics that they had uh, installed or inflicted on them was because mm-hmm. of some higher order mucky muck yep. in whatever kind of space uh, empire we've got going on here being like, oh, this will make you better at X, Y, and Z. You're mm-hmm. required to have it. So she doesn't really have much choice in the matter and then yeah. basically goes, oh, well, I'm done with that. No, we're not going to remove your augments. Why would we? That's expensive. Yeah. So she's she's stuck with a kid. Mm-hmm. She's stuck with, you know, being completely othered by this process. And... uh after getting ratted out and treated like crap, she's essentially ejected from the factory without the knowledge mm-hmm. of yeah. our uh, our terraformer. Yeah, yep, our, our space kind space gentleman. terraforming former criminal, yeah. and uh, so she goes to the streets uh, or you know wherever else she can. Maybe she's just surviving in the wild like an animal. 
and mm. they're gonna try to put her down like a monster because hey you know she could oh. have cool claws and super speed and stuff you know oh, that's that's true Sci- sci-fi gets us gets us some interesting places so it doesn't just have to be straight to the um mm-hmm. the hooking so thing but it's a he, different he, level of dehumanization right so yeah so he's out doing some fine-tuning terraforming stuff and he comes across drones trying to put this woman down throws himself in the way yeah gets into an argument with space Javert, who's suddenly like the somewhere in the in the logarithms there's like a ding tone of voice noted mm-hmm. wasn't yep. there this time 150 years ago when someone talked to you like that mm-hmm. your vocal pattern recognized <laughs> like mm. Mm. Yeah. and then you know so, so start to put things together so she's probably mortally injured by the drones before yeah. before yeah. this goes down and while it takes mm-hmm. her some time to die she's like i have a daughter please put yep. care for her um so at that meanwhile point, yeah, meanwhile meanwhile on another planet mm-hmm. um people desperate to get a conviction basically just alter a guy to look like Valjean used to look and say here's the here's our criminal yeah yeah that sounds about right yeah um so so our our space Valjean gets torn but decides to make a stop there before he tries to pick up the daughter so, so the Thenadiers. <laughs> huh. Now I'm almost thinking, at this point, one evil opposite is fine as a thing. Like, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm good with just running with the idea of, oh no, this guy is scum. They're kind mm-hmm. of an unrepentant in any way criminal. They're just always looking for an opportunity. And I see the whole thing with Cassette because they've got these weird genetic augments and, and stuff oh. like that passed down. It's something along the lines of almost like a space zoo, but with people. Oh, like, oh god, this floating kind zoo of ship, and oh, oh, you. Mm. Yeah, he yeah, it the feels worst. scummy, right? He, it feels he scummy. He is the enough. worst. <laughs> but yes, that that definitely that that gives you your 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 image of the the, the poor girl in the cage this time. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. with the right. augmentations or whatever they happen to be. Oh, so. So, gets her out of there for however much mm-hmm. exorbitant money. Yeah. Uh, you know, what <laughs> What uh, our, our Thenadier is doing is not super legal. Mm-hmm. So, um, they, they definitely get uh, a little bit of a, oh, God, like, why is this drone ship here? <laughs> How oh. did it get here? <laughs> <laughs> Since there's there's definitely gonna be some running through space stuff, finding a new yep. you know, face, um, yeah. and you know it being that whole thing of, all right, like finding ways to kind of disguise, to finding a new place mm-hmm. to go. Uh, I almost feel like the the interesting thing would be like, what does he shift to from being a terraformer? Because that's where all the money had came, and I feel like there was yeah. probably be some very similar. But not well, quite he's... as crazy uh, a yeah. thing. Well, the part of me it says, like, you know, he normally hands up in Paris, so I guess some sort of galactic center now, an urban-y planet. Sure. I, I mean, no, we, I... Could, we could say just Earth. Like, actually, literally, oh. it was back to on Earth. Like, but Yeah, but like then the... you gotta stop me from actually putting them in Paris. Um, I... I really don't. I mean, and mind you, this is a theoretical story. Like, they True. could literally be in Paris if we want to go that way. And I feel I, like it'd be interesting for the the small scale being, like, uh, of Terraformer, him being, mm-hmm. like, a jeweler or something. Like, he creates and crafts uh, the actual needed uh, molecules and atoms and stuff out of yeah. nothing. And, like, so it's a very scaled down, but still, like, somewhat... Yeah. A fusion you know, good workshop. money kind of thing. Yeah. I like so, that phrase. Yeah, I, I, just, I dig it as an idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's a whole thing of, oh no, like, Earth is going through a bit of a reformation period. Oh, uh, yes. Um, I mean, well, at some point, at, at some point we had to stop for, you know, 50 pages to talk about the greatest space battle that ever was. Um, oh, yeah. Which, which led us to our, our current climate of things, of the... Um, uh, the acidity of the ocean be- having gone up two full points or something ridiculous. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of different things of okay, like why are people 
why are people playing now when they're functionally immortal and one of those mm -hmm. oh yeah well you know food and whatever else oh, yeah. food, food remains a problem well um, i mean there, there might be maybe uh i mean Fantine's originally from Paris before everything, so maybe the forced genetic coding thing is just a thing that the population of Earth's underclass has had to deal with for a while. Yeah. So maybe the plague is some sort of genetic degradation that a lot of the people with the code... Not everyone, so because that, you know, that's not necessarily in danger, but like something related to that. Yep. Could very much or be that kind of idea. Hmm? Yeah. There's a couple different ways you can go with that. Right. Uh, but once we've got them on Earth, okay, so now we've got our, you know, figure of, of privilege. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a part of me that's almost like, you know, um, you know, where do we want to go with that? And I, I feel like it's that whole, like, okay, like, you know, um, and I hate saying, like, my brain is starting to make this more and more anime, and I am trying my best not to just see uh, Cassette as this, like, super cute, like, space cat girl. But, um... Uh, this is closer <laughs> to certain aspects of, like, 60, 70 sci-fi than you'd think, so it's not necessarily bad. Sure. <laughs> but, um... So, like, yeah, you've got this uh, privileged character, mm -hmm. right? We're gonna have to have yep. that come up. The one who's going to try and take care of Cassette. And, uh, there, therein lies the thing of like trying to imagine what the Space Empire looks like. That's going to be, that's going to be a season to taste, and it's also going to be one of those like more work than we can very easily do in this in this yes, podcast yeah, look, really quickly. Look, I, I I will say that if we if we took the, it would not take a lot of work for us or for you to go through like your almost your 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 Federation style bureaucracy or your like. Sp or your space your dune-esque you know space empire where everyone has their napoleonic costumes and call the call the old man the potty shah or there's another variation that's like blanking out of my head oh, or the, your very corporate style where it's just you know yep. various like people obsessed with the space bucks or your empire empire where it's all like feudal titles and like, there are a lot of different ways you can get and they all like i think it would be it doesn't take long to, to fit a, things uh... into the pieces for this I think it'd be very interesting to see it being kind of the empire transition from a mm. overbearing space empire expansionist, uh, you know, mankind must thrive on all the planets for the riches of the universe are ours kind of thing. And obviously mm. we have not thrown in any aliens at this point because mm -hmm. that creates a whole different uh, kind of story. So we're going a little more down to earth, which I feel is fitting with the themes of what we're we're trying to mm. accomplish here. That's but fair. um, I mean, having Thanadir be an alien does cut a lot of why all Thanadir is awful. That's, that's cheating. That's cheating. Yeah. Of course, they have no human values. They're not, mm -hmm. in fact, a human being. Yeah, they're a bug monster from Alpha Centauri. Like, okay, mm. they weren't they weren't stealing from bodies. They were eating. <laughs> completely different um right other than that kind of thing but like yeah. um oh man i feel like i'm starting to hit the point where i'm like cracking the rest of the story gets a little tricky like i i think once the, you get into uh, earth the story starts to play out the same either way you have yeah. a privileged... the, the one interesting thing i'll note is that um marius's whole internal crisis gets this extra wrinkle Mm -hmm. uh, as Cassette has to have, as uh, they have to explain to him um, that Cassette is genetically altered. Yeah. So it's not just her father's a criminal. It's like, okay, so that woman you love. Yeah. Which puts in this interesting position of the. Well, here's um, the thing, too. The prejudice that's out there way on mm -hmm. the edge of the colonies may not be the prejudice oh. here. Oh, that's a good point. I mean, especially if there's sort of a, like, you know, gene-augmented populace being abused versus a... <laughs> Nazis. Uh, genetically <laughs> pure uh, upper-class model thing going mm. on. Yeah. I can definitely see there being a level of, like, oh, no, like, I get that. That's fine. Oh. That doesn't Oh, bother you me. had no choice but a criminal. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, yeah oh yeah no they they broke galactic code and you know we've we've been we've been fighting virtual wars <laughs> yeah and <laughs> models and scales and stuff because doing actual warfare is just far too you know, costly 
and expensive. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, lots, there's so many sci-fi things and tropes you can throw in partially because the oh, story is yeah. so big and so epic. But uh, mm-hmm. I guess, I guess nearing the end, uh, you have to have. So this prison ship, I, all I can imagine is the AI mm-hmm. has been, you know, essentially by having been spared from mm-hmm. whatever kind of super virus. Well, I could. This is. I, oddly enough, I can see this thing of the it pretends to be a fixer who is giving drones to help out the rebels. Oh man, that's but that, that's twisted. And it work as one of the things it works for a while until someone traces back the code to this the ship hovering in orbit and are like that's the Javert. Yep, and then they like and so they, they and so they like lock the AI out of its ship mm-hmm. until you know until Valjean just decides to undo it. So I could I could see that I could see the like ship being like destroyed and it just being the drone that's left with the oh, AI in it. Oh, and, oh, that too. They actually just destroy the. And so it being one of those things of after sparing him, you know, in the small drone body, suddenly kind of oh. reduced from its former self, has mm-hmm. a moment of after seeing the slaughter <laughs> perpetuated by the space empire. Um, yeah has its moment of revelation where its programming kind of breaks and it's like i'm supposed to serve mankind but mankind is right before me all of the things that law is supposed to do don't actually do that all my hyper calculations are correct um this is the problem i have helped nothing self-destruct and just explodes yeah. on the spot but i mean yep. it's not as dramatic or, as walking or, off a cliff yeah. but well i was gonna say it's like well or if if the ship doesn't get blown up mm-hmm. then the ship can fly into the sun yeah. yeah. It depends on how ridiculous you want to make it. But there's, there's, there's definitely the idea of an evil AI that suddenly understands it's an evil AI and, mm-hmm. and terminates. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is fun. So then we've got the whole, okay, he's got to save mm-hmm. our Marius character, which there's so many well, ways that, to go about yeah. this. The revolt can be as crazy as you want. It can happen in virtual space. It can happen across the planet all at once. It can, there can be a big thing that they could have to go up to the moon for it or onto some I big mean, ship. I mean, I'm kind of liking the idea of a fight out in the asteroid belt where they've like clustered oh. asteroids together to make barriers and stuff like that. Oh. And it being a... I, I, I kind of like that. Yeah. There was like this... There would, you know, at the funeral is a grand tour of the solar system, and they just all these little ships show up, and then they like they do a, a quick like, like and... drive by with their ships uh-huh. on Earth before hightailing it back yep. out to the yep. edge of the. And solar they're out of the asteroids, like him, him like throwing on a suit, throwing a suit of him over the shoulders through tunnels in some of these asteroids because mm-hmm. he knows how you move around. Oh them. yeah, yeah. This his former knowledge comes into play. Mm-hmm. It's a nice little neat yeah. circle of how how stuff yeah. works and. Uh, you know, that yep. goddamn space pirate that's been out there all the time and made things <laughs> worse throughout yep. the whole story because they're the greediest, worst thing ever. They used yep. to be a zookeeper, but now they're now they're mm-hmm. a space pirate. You know. Yep. Yep. Is there... his, his daughter's been on Earth trying to, you know, schmooze with the royalty to get ideas of, mm-hmm. like, where to hit and when, mm-hmm. when she falls from Arius. And so, it, it, so our space pirate probably actually loses his ship when his daughter heroically throws it into the, the firing line. Yep. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's yeah. pretty good right there. A lot of the same... A lot yeah. of the same... Uh, and of course, there's story. this part of me that wants to be ridiculously on the nose of the uh, Thenadir on the run, finds his hands on an experimental time machine, goes back to 1830s New York and becomes a slave trader. Um... Uh, I mean, in many ways, it's one of those, I almost see it being just the sadness of when he takes the money and starts another evil space zoo. Just does the Ooh, same yeah. shit. Yep, right back to where he was. Right mm-hmm. where he was, and right into the level of, like, you're a fucking monster. Yeah. Maybe this time he's doing aliens instead of genetically augmented oh. people, because aliens don't have right yet, rights yet in the space empire. <laughs> Uh, yep nice. i know nice right on the that in. nice nice good mm. yeah so yeah oh. where now they're functionally immortal mm-hmm. and so the idea of the aging thing could be well, very different because this could take well, the span of a thousand years that's that's true a lot of time could be passing in all of this 
and I could see it being the whole thing of, okay, like, yeah, like, everything's good, you got me out of there, or whatever, but you've you've admitted to me mm-hmm. that you committed galactic law. That never leaves the record. It's all backed up on the super AI that helps run mm-hmm. our planet. Like, can't, can't help you, buddy. Um, mm. And so then, like, they get married, they live comfortably for several hundred years. Yep. And then something oh, yeah. happens with, you know, our, our space entity or this asshole being like, I've found out who yep. they are from probably scavenging whatever's left of the Javert. Oh, yep, yep. And being like... Drone in hand, yeah. I've got brilliant. this information. It could ruin your life and everything. It's like... How long have you been off planet? All the laws are different now, and you're an idiot. Um, mm-hmm. Also, where where is he? You know where he is. Tell us where he is, yeah. and uh, mm-hmm. find him chilling somewhere. And it may just be one of those. It's it's literally been so long. It's like oh no, like I've I, nobody knows what the actual problem is. It's just degradation over time. Maybe mm-hmm. uh, maybe whatever's yeah. supposed to be working isn't. And uh, they have some touching last words. They get to hear. He gets to hear all about how Earth is looking in his yep. his last year of time because everything's bigger. Um, so mm-hmm. they spend a year with him as he's uh, slowly oh. but surely degrading, and then eventually passes. And they're like, "Where do you want to be?" And he's just like, "Just bury me back on the planet I helped terraform." Oh, yeah. And that's uh. Yeah, and that that'd be pretty pretty cool and he'd remember you know the guy from the the the, the, the nice mm-hmm. station and yep. uh you mm-hmm. know the, the the woman who'd also died on the planet they'd started on or that they'd put yep. together. And uh yeah. Yeah. I mean I, I, I can I can hear it. it's like so in one particular arm of the galaxy, a planet was terraformed about a thousand years ago. Uh, it's got a big thriving population, but they still care. They know enough to care about the environment. Out in that environment, there's this little hill. The creator kept trying, but never could get the, the light to shade ratio just where he wanted it, but loved it anyway. Under that hill, many years ago, the, oh, someone was buried. Nothing there marks that it's the creator of the planet, but this little stone remains. Yeah. Space is warmer. Ah. No, I like it. I think it's pretty good. So I think that wraps us up as far as the uh, sci-fi kind of story goes. It sounds pretty good. Right. I'm, I'm having it in a nice place. So um, yep. But... Getting on, to, getting on to those other two genres because we gotta try and hit mm-hmm. all four. So the horror That's story. Okay. Now, I think here uh, I like the idea of John Valjean flat out being some kind of monster okay that that does make because sense. rather than just you know like criminal well, what what do you what do you how do you use criminal in a horror story and it's like well what's your what's the thing that you know oh everyone's scared of criminals are so bad but him just being a monster i think that's it's a good place we do have some notes on this one mm-hmm. um so the idea that john valjean is quite literally a demon um, summoned up by some sort of sorcery to work on Earth. Very, very ceremonial magician, very Key of Solomon mm-hmm. kind of thing. Like, you know, a sorcerer's yeah. like, well, you're a demon, of course you exist for labor. <laughs> like, just flat mm-hmm. out the thing of, you you exist to be abused. That is that is your purpose in life. You shouldn't have, you shouldn't have defied God and fallen. Um... So somehow they escape from their uh, mystical confines and enchantment, and after great uh, hurled upon abuse, running many different places and then maybe possessing people on the way, because you know that sounds like a demon yeah. thing to kind of do, but it often being one of those they're they're chased, you know, like they're mm-hmm. exercised and cast out across the globe with uh, perhaps this one very very determined exorcist chasing right. them they at some point end up 
in a Buddhist monastery. Now, rather than having the whole kind of Christian approach of, oh man, we're going to just crush him. This this is the the monk that shows them kindness. Who, upon encountering them, and it's a whole thing of, I'm possessing you. And it's like, oh, well, all right. How long would you like my body for? <laughs> why, why can I hear you at the same time? Because, like, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. I have been making it a point to escape from the confines of reality and all the terrors and awfulness of it. Do you need anything? And it being the weird thing of he, he ends up possessing this monk who in turn does all these good things for him before <laughs> he's fully possessed him. And he literally like goes peace out and like transcends out of the body to leave it to him. <laughs> so the thing he gives is his actual body. I like that. So, so Buddhist, Buddhist like kind of a uh, philosophy and stuff. Once I think it was, uh, I am probably butchering the quote, but it, the greatest miracle is to turn a bad man good. Mm. So it's it's mm. it's once again back to the kind of religious redemption arc. So it, it it is actually one of those you take my body, but what you have to do, <laughs> what you have to do is follow these virtues to make a good life. So now this monk stops being a monk because well they're possessed by the demon <laughs> who's been yeah. who's basically been bound charged to become good and in the meantime they have a demon hunter still looking for them somehow i am assuming using portents or mystical tools and there was the thought of making this a very wuxia style horror mm -hmm. film some really cool wire work and some jumping crazy effects and stuff. I, I kind of dig this as an idea. Yeah, that that could be pretty fun. I'm pretty much run to the end of my notes on this, so so we'll yeah. start kind of thinking out this here. So once he's gone from that, he would have to follow the kind of life that is set down as being a noble and virtuous life by the uh, hmm. by the various uh, Buddhist uh, virtues. So yeah. he can't he can't make poisons, he can't make alcohol, uh he can't make weapons. So doing doing sewing or clothes or something like that is actually pretty reasonable. Okay, so so the idea of textiles is remains. Yeah. Um so we, could, we could move that route without any real problem. Now then the idea of okay, so this is this is what's going on. I'm trying to to really like remember no no remember uh what kind of things are considered uh, if if they're ancient you know wise uh what what mm. women's work is considered but I, I assume textiles are open I could be wrong on that probably a lot Usually. of things that I'm not thinking of but either way uh still setting up the sort of um I you know uh, almost pseudo feminist hey here's here's a gainful employment you can do that is not utterly demeaning to provide a life for yourself before this demon hunter shows up. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I feel like they would be a very strong Confucian. If we were to, that, that does make sense for, for that. It's, you know, the, the precepts of society, the certain ways things are meant to be run. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's... maybe a warped Confucian. Cause you kind of have to be, to be a violent Confucian, but, well, that's uh, that, that's what Neo Confucianism is for. Yeah. Um, so, you know, very much this is how society works. Blah blah blah. You have a business. I am making. I'm here to minister, and make sure it's all mm -hmm. running up to code. But I am also an exorcist to look for the evils in men that might be here. Oh, you'll find no evils here. Da, da, da. Um. Mm -hmm. So, something goes wrong, and I, okay, if we're if we're doing Waxia. It's got to be some fighting, yeah. so so probably oh, one yes. of those. So then, what happens? Uh, probably a brawl somewhere in the streets where it's one of yeah. those. Huh? You certainly seem to have a lot of inhuman strength for <laughs> for just a, a regular citizen who's uh, running this uh, business here. Yeah, and uh, so <laughs> so it becomes a noteworthy hmm on the beard um 
one would only one hope. would only hope. Um, we could still have a Fantine type character. It, the thing is, is, so much can play out very similarly. Obviously, true. And really, it's true. There, there are lots of pieces that are similar. Like, I mean, this is this is also a genre that's all about like sentimentality, right? And heartstrings yep. and archetypes. So, I think I think one of the best things though is the fact mm-hmm. that there is another demon running around Mm -hmm. being this one's evil opposite who has no compunctions Mm. because the thenadir for this would be just a monster um and in in turn like okay how does he because i I almost feel like there's a very different kind of because i mean he's if this is a demon Mm. money isn't really there like they have money Oh, oh, but if it's, like, Mammon or some other demon that's, like, a demon of oh. greed, it's very oh, easy to see the whole thing yeah. of, I want to keep the kid, but if you give me enough money, I'll let it go, mm-hmm. but it has to be enough money. So, literally, the mother has entrusted their child to a demon, knowingly or unknowingly, um, for protection. Maybe, yeah. maybe she is, um hunted in a way that is uh even more important than 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 thought I'm not sure um oh there's some something going on with her yeah i i feel like that's a more likely because because the kind of genre we're, we're running with i could see it being that one of those sense. well you know okay sure someone in privilege but that may mean her kid actually has like an important heritage beyond simply her uh yeah. Even or or she's special and important in some way that we don't like really quite understand. I mean, she sells off a lot of her, you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, in the story, she literally sells her hair and her teeth, and it's so freaking yeah. sad. Uh, yeah, with, with I mean, could, she could be like uh, f- former wife of a uh, member of the recently overthrown dynasty. Yep, could be, could be something like that. Oh yeah, that would that would actually work pretty well. And so there's a certain level of, you know, protecting the noble that yeah, the... cannot be, mm-hmm. cannot be named lest yeah. they have X, Y, or Z bad thing happen to them because of the yeah. current political climate. And that still puts her in a position of not necessarily having been always of privilege of like could have been common-ish and then just ended up in a vaguely privileged position and then kicked right back out of it when things changed. Yeah. I mean, that's entirely, that's entirely a possibility. Mm-hmm. Um so especially if it wasn't so much wife as mistress who got to live in the palace because and eh, whatever right so I, I feel like there's there'd be the whole thing of and everything's gonna be throwing a splash of fighting in it you know oh, just, yes. just wherever it had to, it has to yeah. be shown yeah like the energy is gonna get punched in the face uh more, more than i feel is proper but as much as people would like probably I get the feeling there'd be this whole thing of Thenadir would be like, oh, but I'm a temple spirit. I'm I'm okay. Mm. I'm safe. Look at me. I'm small. I'm I'm bound to this place. Yeah. Like it can't be a problem. And of oh. course, it's not true. But yeah. but you know the I little like cowardly acts. Oh yeah, I possessed your father and walked him off a battlefield. Really, I was just looking for the mm. body I could find. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know whatever like it's pretty close and yeah. sure i took everything he owned before i left but that's besides the point mm-hmm. um so if this was set in like i mean china's had some very famous and interesting revolts oh, that yes. it Many could obviously years. dovetail into them i mean i i always think of the romance of the three kingdoms because I think that's a really there's this video game, yeah, because the video game, and and then yeah. the exposure I mean, it, to it, the 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 yeah to the video game. Yes, yes, because because of that, that that leads our generation into finding out about this particular story uh, in that particular time, which is great. Yep. So, Romance of the Three Kingdoms style uh, stuff, like okay, yeah, it, it, whatever uprisings you want to run with mm-hmm. and historical backdrop, yeah. there are plenty of very big interesting and pseudo mythical wars to play with um yeah and i guess like you know the horror aspects can come out as much as you season to taste again 
you know, the fact that there's monsters and demons running around possessing people, if it's not enough for you, it can get worse. Yeah, that, that, that's true. If, if there are if there are cruelties that feel need to be inflicted on the world, it is easy enough to have, you know, in addition to just the general cruelties, the idea of demons ramping it up for a scene if need be. Mm-hmm. I mean, in, in the book, like, there are a couple times that Thanadir calls in a gang of brigands, so the idea that he has a couple other demons on call... Yes, which and, makes for some amazing and, fight scenes. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm just... I'm trying to think of, like, if Eponine is, like... An actual daughter demon? Or... I mean, and, and that... Or it's just a girl who's been raised by him in such a way? Oh, there's, hmm. there's a couple it's... different ways to go with that. I mean, like, it, it could be one of those things of, you know, well, raised by demons. Maybe her chi is, you know, poisoned and monstrous or something like that. And... Yeah, or, or, or it could just be that, you know, he raised her because... He knew she was destined to grow up to be a beautiful treasure, so he wanted that for himself. If we're going into the greed thing, yes. A, a treasure he's immediately oh. using and turning towards, mm-hmm. you know, malicious ends. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. uh, fighting, running, mm-hmm. evading, saving uh, the young girl who's probably an inheritor of a dynasty that is currently on yeah. the outs, because that is a thing that happens. Mm-hmm. Um... And then uh, we get to where they're they're sort of hiding in the capital city, I'd assume. Um, oh, by the end, yes. And, uh, you know, there's still a demon hunter out for them. There's still this other demon on the loose actually causing problems. Mm-hmm. And a, a certain level of, okay, like, I've, I've followed these virtues. What else is needed for this? Uh, girl that i've tried to help here of course he has to teach her really awesome kung fu because why wouldn't you um i mean because he's got what the monks know knows and then whatever he himself mm -hmm. has like i I feel like that's just this is the thing you do and uh that this is obviously how her and marius meet that's just how that's how her and marius meet uh you know there was certainly probably things where her and epony were were fighting when they were kids a little bit yeah Yes, uh, definitely. We'll, we'll have a fight between them. It doesn't happen in the original story, but I really don't care. No, it is no. like, at the very no, least, no. a childhood grudge being, like, settled. Y- yes. Um, so Marius, this this young traveling minister or whatever, who's, uh, yep. who's, who's, who's consulted their oracles and is weighing in on the side of this, this rebellion somehow being better than the current. For ignoring their uh, their divinations and and going with it anyway, whichever way you want to look at that. Um, nice, right? So it's so like more seasons to taste, more more things you can do, a little yeah. different there. Uh, eventually, getting to a really amazing battle in whatever location feels uh, appropriate. There's a lot of good picks, but make it pretty epic. Because it can just be yeah. a street corner where they've piled some things up, but you know, if you wanna, if you wanna turn up the mythic level, you know, they're in a hidden fortress or. Oh, oh yes, this can end up out in the wilderness. Out in the wilderness, a temple, whatever you want to mm-hmm. do, and eventually it being one of those, like, well, you know, by rumor, <laughs> by rumor, mm-hmm. one of the things that powers that be say, oh yeah, they're consorting with demons. Oh, this is very nice. we we know this is the thing. They're they're consorting with arts. We have the uh, mandate of heaven. They do not. Got to crush them. Got to get them. Mm-hmm. And oddly enough, a demon will get involved. But <laughs> mm-hmm. so so the the romance thing starts to happen. And uh, at some point, it's like, well, I've been trying to simply live the most peaceful, virtuous life I can. But there's a certain point where you have to kind of make a choice or a stand and so goes mm-hmm. out and defends things and um yep. i would actually so say it'd be kicking. very this would be a great place for a big battle where essentially his mortal body is mortally wounded and so it is Ooh, going to I die like mm-hmm. but he's still moving it still moving and so eventually gets towards like where um you know, has to uh, drag Marius out of the thing, which you know, 
thankfully uh privilege and deniability mm-hmm. it all kind of kind of goes away because uh you know this 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 demon hunter that has yep. haunted him this whole time has to question their life because they've ruthlessly been destroying spirits left and right and banishing them mm-hmm. and now has no idea if he knows the difference between a good spirit and a bad one and maybe all he's been doing mm-hmm. is just pushing uh spirits out of the world with a blind eye and making the world a worse place and then uh i don't know crouching tiger hidden dragons himself off a cliff um yeah yeah so you you'd you'd and then, you know can it can end fairly similarly with okay they're together and this demon who's who's essentially done everything they can is unsure of what their ultimate fate will be near the end but this other demon mm-hmm. the greed demon showing back up yeah like i i like the idea of as he's getting marries out he does have one last climactic fight mm-hmm. with, with the greed demon yeah um but kicking his ass doesn't really do much because he can just show back up on another body a little bit just, i mean it, it's a just, it's a great idea to just keep having this thing get hit and mm-hmm. maybe it's forms being more and more pathetic every time it shows up oh oh i, I kind of like that too it just gets smaller and smaller over time and so like you know in the last one it's it's there you know and it's it's trying to basically steal wedding presents and crap mm-hmm. yep. and it, it revealing because you know hey i'm a demon <laughs> like <laughs> i want you to take care of them because you're a person and you seem like you are a good person i want you to be good to them and never tell them that i've been a demon the whole time mm-hmm. and then as uh we get to our ending stages with that mortal body dying, uh, mm-hmm. the greed demon trying its last gambit to be like, I'm going to get to the royalty through this princess. <laughs> and a certain <laughs> level of maybe, I don't know, sticky rice to the forehead, lol, no. Oh, um, just flat out, yep. <laughs> and then the whole thing of, you know, like, ah, don't destroy me. There's a greater demon than me still. <laughs> I know oh, where it is. I know how it's just like <laughs> you're a pathetic little toad. Just get out of here and bedevil mankind no more. Which it immediately mm. said, "I'll do that," and then went to bedevil mankind again because it's awful. Yeah. It's because that's what it does. awful creature. Yeah, but they they track down our uh, our mm. demon demon friend who is fairly worried they're going to slip back into the grips of hell because uh mm. you know what what because they are something to keep him tied and then what's happened but then you know sees a vision of uh the buddhist monk there holding out his hand yeah you know and uh you know daughter and and you know marius both get to say goodbye to them as they they slip from that mortal coil and uh you know transcend Mm-hmm. and uh as far as you know and then like maybe the whole thing being like you know i mean there's so many different ways that can go down as far as dealing with the body or the mark that's left behind but i can see it being the thing of the ancestor altar having the like you know solomonic mark instead of the picture of the person oh, okay i kind of like that you know yeah and then having some real pithy phrase about, you know, the difference between a demon and a man is not in where they come from, mm-hmm. but what they do and the time they have. And yeah, real credits. Yeah. I, Very nice. Yeah, I like that yeah. one. Yeah, that's a good one. <sighs> okay. So we're on to the end. All right. So we're on to superheroes now. Okay. You love doing superhero stuff. So Jean Valjean is super villain. I mean, mm-hmm. they've got to have super strength because they obviously, well, obviously. did. Obviously. They probably have super intellect too, I'm guessing. Mm-hmm. And also the fact they kept escaping and that's why their sentence is so long is the funniest oh. goddamn thing yeah. in the world. Yeah, like that is, admittedly, that does feel very super villain. I. At this juncture, I should um, give a non-public domain recommendation for those out there. Um, 
Kurt Busiek's Astro City series is honestly, in my opinion, the best superhero work of the last 30 years. Um, I don't know how much of it you can actually get anymore. It feels like you only get the more recent stuff and not the old stuff. But if you can track down a copy of The Tarnished Angel, um, it is a great take on a supervillain trying to reform and the difficulties of that. Very fun story. Check it out. Yeah, no, it is a really good story. Good plug, mm-hmm. good plug. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, just somewhere on the subject. But but yeah, so, so super escape skills, super strength. A super intellect that he might not even realize he has. I mean, that's it's he's not really fully aware of it. I'm just thinking about the idea of well, like, and then when they get done, they do good and they're like a mayor. And I'm like, well, oh, you're yeah. you're mm-hmm. this. He basically, after having escaped, um, possibly meeting, I don't know, let's say, a benevolent space alien. Oh, could do, okay, I like the idea like of benevolent space alien as our as our kindness personified, being hmm. like, oh yeah, it looks like you've been pretty much trashed by uh, all these superheroes and stuff. Because I I would almost feel like it's one of those things of they're trying to do work, but like through yeah. circumstance have have gotten into even more superhero misunderstandings. Oh, yeah. Than they really had any, and after being just brutalized this this ufo kind of picks him up and it's like no Mm. you're not bad like here's all this stuff and he tries to like heist all this alien tech and they're like well yeah (laughs) i was gonna give you all of that make sure you take the super suit too (laughs) (laughs) and so giving it all to them they're able to like change their face and have a new Mm -hmm. look on life and stuff and it's like why are you giving me this all? And it's like, because you're going to do good things with it for the human race. Why? Because. <laughs> like, yeah. Just weirdly inscrutable, inscrutable alien. Like, I like that. Like, yeah, I like that. Nope, I just, I kind of know who you are inside. Um, or that or the, like, scary, I've run this many virtual algorithms. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so they, they reinvent themselves as, like, this heroic figure. But we were going to have... Yeah, there's a there's a Javert. Mm-hmm. Uh, my my first thought is sort of a, a merciless version of like a Superman, something right. along those lines. Somebody who's almost like Superman, but with Batman's like grim jerk kind of nature. Like people don't yeah. change. Yeah. Crime's Bit always deep... the same. Punch the homeless. Um, yeah. Bit of a deep cut for this, but you know, I'm thinking the you know whole Eradicator Superman thing. Yeah, that would be that would actually be pretty good too. Um, so almost like the I mean you know the alien robot. The Superman meets Punisher bit does have a certain level yeah. of uh, correctness to it. So yeah, they're doing good. They start a team. It's an all female team, which is except for him, which is kind of interesting yeah. as a thought. Um, mm-hmm. And at some point thing goes wrong uh yeah. with our fan team character uh, now so so this i mean technically speaking we kind of went this route a bit with the space opera but we did does this world have a problem with muties and and you know that is that is a route we could take uh even if it's not that as a route i could even see it being one of those things of just as bad as essentially hey we know you have some criminal past. Not even super criminal past. Just, oh yeah, like we like getting straight to the whole thing of they basically were like, you used to be a whore, get out of here. Ooh. It could be that, yeah, that petty and right. that yeah. ugly. Uh-huh. Like, you will bring yeah. down the team, you are not allowed on it. So she goes out for like a solo hero career, but she doesn't have quite enough power to like pull it off. And oh. so she ends up getting hurt so bad during yep. these transactions and such that, uh, you know, essentially, like, at one point, she's, she's like, you know, she's been hurt badly, she needs money, etc. She tries to pull off some, like, she does some minor altercation with somebody, maybe a mm-hmm. sidekick of Javert's, and he's like, no, you're going down, you're going to jail, Oh. And you know, our Jean Valjean 
is like, I don't think so, no. <laughs> like, knock that off. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's fighting. Maybe it's just words. Either's fine. Because I can see the whole thing of it's like, but I believe in the law. This yeah. is a law. This is this paragon of justice here. Yep. That John Valjean's become, like, fine, I guess. But once again, mortally injured. And, oh, I mm-hmm. have a daughter who has the same kind of powers as me and so now we get to this other and and uh, you know the 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 identity the identity of our uh, super villain becomes superhero does we get out somehow you know yeah well i mean if, if it did come to blows mm-hmm. I, i'm sure the guy recognized getting punched in the face that way oh yeah that's <laughs> nobody's hit me that hard since you Mm. but um but we've got we've got the uh daughter who obviously will have uh similar powers to the mother who is currently being cared for by a very uh <coughs> reputable uh mm. school for gifted youngsters except oh. it isn't <laughs> at all <laughs> one of those very mm. public good face everything's fine but in the meantime it's kind of i could see it kind of dovetailing into like uh the modern day uh fixation on reality television bit less oh it's all about like putting the kids on display Mm -hmm. yeah like okay like we do we do a lot of okay now you need to smile need to do this need to do that and so it's all oh yeah everything looks picture perfect everybody seems happy there's almost a tourist vibe Uh to it like oh yeah invite invite people in we'll do pictures with your your kids and stuff and as far as she goes it's like oh no we're not gonna include you in on that angle you know, you're mm-hmm. you're kind of farmed oh. out. You need to be here to make our kids look good. Use your crazy yeah, light you powers need... to make sure that the cameras look good for them. Yeah, not, not photogenic and yep. has issues with you know with crowds of people. Like you're you you're just not you're not you're you're a you're a B minus player, mm-hmm. but your powers have some support utility. Yeah, essentially. And so mm-hmm. at some point they just kind of show up and like, nope, she's coming with me, mm-hmm. and. It's like, well... What you can do about it? Like, you said it's a school for young, powered people, so it'll break easy. Uh-huh. And I feel like in this case, it's like, well, I mean, it, we don't need to play around with wealth. Wealth in this world is more about um, your wealth of powers. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I could see it being one of those, well, why would I do that? Because I will punch you? <laughs> mm, I do not like getting punched to the face, and I am a coward at heart. Yeah. There might well, be that, some that, 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 some negotiation. I can there. see him jumping out of his wheelchair, running and hiding behind his desk. Um, mm-hmm. Jesus Christ! If you're going that, route, I mean, um, depending. Oh God, that actually is hilarious as a thought. Yeah. That is messed mm-hmm. up. That's a really messed up thought. I kind of love it, but it's really messed up. Mm. Okay, so yeah, like, um, so gets her out of there, possibly with some punches, possibly mm-hmm. not. Mm-hmm. Hard to say. Probably a once again back to the whole eh, how much you want to do it, but I think I think yeah. maybe veering away from the economics because it's a superhero story is probably not a yeah. bad idea. Though honestly, that idea of like killing them with optics, mm-hmm. like showing up on camera and like and turning the screws to them on, on the story of why she needs to leave, yeah, like that, that could be a bit fun. Oh yeah, no, it definitely could. Um, moving on there's a level of okay like he's already got disguise tech of some type from these aliens oh, yeah. so getting a new face yep. isn't the hardest part for him and has to reinvent themselves yet again and so mm-hmm. they come up with a superhero persona that doesn't highlight their super strength and so now they're posing more yeah. as like rooftop vigilantes yeah. despite the fact they have like real much yeah. greater power than that yeah. but it's I can, I can almost see him be like a, a fixer of sorts like the guy who will create things for other superheroes. Yeah, you know, going with the whole textile angle, etc. Maybe they're making super clothes. You know, like super mm. fibers, putting it together. Mm. Maybe, maybe the alien tech had a weaving machine. I don't know. Um, Neat. Yeah, it's fun. Um, but yeah, something a little much like is that under the radar. Mm-hmm. 
but they're though I could actually see that as the compromise of the you know trying to talk about this to the kid and finally just talking to the okay all right once a month we'll go jump around on the rooftops and you know stop crime thanks yep yep and uh time passes everything seems fine and then a registration act thing happens mm. you know one of those things that superheroes can come to blows over where there's a certain yep well there's a very authoritarian crappy way to do this and a much less authoritarian way to do this and uh they lean hard into the uh mm-hmm. well yep. we've so we've got some this young hotshot hero <laughs> Who's got? Oh, yeah. He's got a lot of good gadgets and stuff. <laughs> Maybe yeah. he's a legacy hero. His dad was a somebody well, who's on the opposite uh, yes, side. Yes. <laughs> well, y- yes. Um. Well. Oh, yeah. There'd be that too. Plus, I mean, you know, back during the last crisis event, mm-hmm. which we need to stop this for six issues to talk about. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's important. Yeah, but uh, during the last crisis event, the guy who went on to found the school like saved his dad's life. Hmm. Yep. Or did yeah it. yeah um, totally yeah. did oh and of course meanwhile since the time skip the school got shut down and you know he's just living in the gutter with like a couple of the students or something like they've they've gone from being a, a school that does this thing to like more a small team that uh mm-hmm. most people don't know yeah. about and even if you did you you're not really sure if they're heroes or villains. <laughs> Yeah, it's mostly just, yeah, at this point, rather than the school and the big operation, is just the guy running it and, like, four or five teens who are mostly doing weird things for YouTube like hits. Like some Iron Age wreckage. Um, yeah. <laughs> YouTube hits. So, like, yeah. yeah um, so they're, they're trying to keep low profile, but they occasionally do some rooftop stuff. She meets up with this young hotshot who's like, no, uh-huh. the registration. Bad. <laughs> Which... Yeah. It is. and uh yeah. well it, it's all gonna end up with a, a super powered brawl um mm-hmm. i think here's where you gotta kind of ask yourself like are you leaning more into the superhero genre or are you leaning more into the original story because you can have a story that where there's not sense. as much death but but yeah so you can you can stick with making things and all that that same tragic way you can pull it back a bit very season to taste yeah, it's 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 doable i mean you can have it be more the story of they all brawl and, and you know people don't necessarily die but maybe people mm-hmm. get seriously injured backs broken uh yeah. you know powers lost things that mm-hmm. things that in yep. the end you go okay was this really worth it and uh you know, you can still have the case of, well, this this invulnerable hidden Superman uh, coming out of basically oh, yep. the shadows to save the young vigilante uh-huh. after he... And they manage it. They take down the, the Javert. They find oh, the, yep. uh, the special glowing rock that makes him useless. Mm-hmm. And yep. one of those, you know, why don't you just do it? You could... Show what yeah, you really are, you criminal scum. Yeah. Nope. Mm-hmm. I'm better than that. I'll never stop. That is not my problem. You get out of here with your, you know, special rock poisoning. and Why? Because there's a whole team of superheroes who are still willing to, to do you in right now. Get out of here. And mm-hmm. uh, they leave. And they come back. And they get to kind of see the wreckage of it and go, okay, maybe I was a bad thing. And maybe instead of, if we're, if we're pulling the punch, maybe their thing is, I'm effectively announcing my retirement today, I'm done. Mm-hmm. Like, I can't yeah. do this anymore because I have not been a force for justice. Yeah. Maybe they make the big announcement publicly. So in a way, they mm-hmm. killed their identity, yeah. who they were. Or even, like, if you want to be more about the powers and, 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 and more privately, it could just be he thinks about it and just holds on to the rock for the extra couple of hours it would take to completely depower him. Yeah. Maybe. Um, but they, they, they take themselves out of the story. And yeah. uh, so, potentially, maybe vulnerable to the same exact material. Uh, oh. Oh, now our, that, that would be... Now maybe our... Mm-hmm. Uh, Supervillain turned superhero is on the 
on the down slope. Yeah. And uh, you know, so so things have turned out middling, like they kind of did. Mm-hmm. Like I'm pretty sure it all went yeah. bad, but it was still a level of like I don't I don't think we were done revolutioning yet. If I'm not mistaken. Oh no, but yeah, yeah, the, not, nothing really got resolved in a good way and all that. But um, in the meantime, there's I mean, a, has... a lull uh, in the issue. Mm-hmm. Like we're tabling this for another generation, and uh, yeah. so his daughter joins the uh, the team of this kid, where mm-hmm. they should be well taken care of, and safe, and their powers are are good, and you know all right, like, they can watch out for you now. And, uh, I don't know, they're possibly, I don't know, get picked right back up by the aliens. Uh, that that might be an interesting way to do it. Of the, Like, he's had this weird feeling that his time is coming to an end, but he can't explain it, and it ends up being the, oh, no, I was just coming back to collect you. Yep. Oh, no, there's still other goods to be done out there. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Okay, and then, yeah, and then quite literally leaves the planet, and hopefully, in the cases where they've saved lives, etc., I would probably have actually a section showing that, like, every person that they've saved, or done something good for, goes on to do these great things, and so it has this Mm. huge, like, cluster additive effect. Unfortunately, the one who is leading that school is still doing exactly what they've been doing yep maybe worse maybe they've just gone full mm-hmm. super villain finally and we get to see it and go oh, gosh that's disgusting um yeah so uh, yeah there's a part of me that says the you know he's got the and he gets a statue at the end he, he's given one last right? little pass to get out of the country and we see that he uses it to go to that country ruled by the mad scientist despot <laughs> yeah yeah probably Oh, that actually sounds about right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you know, uh, they get a statue, I think, because they're not actually dead. The, they get a statue. Yeah. And, uh... Yes. There, there's, a part, there's a part of me that, because I like the, the, the name, so this idea that maybe his uh, his superhero identity, like, the it was just, like, a blank faceplate. Oh. So that the statue itself doesn't have a face. That's pretty cool. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, I dig that. That's pretty nifty. Yeah. So uh, I, I, we've we've covered it now. I think I think we've gone through yeah. it all, and you see how this kind of story can play out in a lot of different things. But ultimately, it's always sort of about the idea that um, you know the circumstances we find ourselves in are often an environment or system that kind of puts us there. That kindness can redeem people. And yeah. Well, it, I mean, it, I mean, just looking at it from a numbers game of like all of the kindnesses you see, there's only one that never really pays off. Yes, and even him trying not to be kind committed kindnesses mm-hmm. on multiple occasions. Yeah, pretty much. So, I think that's a definite part of it, and that like the only one who just flat out never does any good mm-hmm. is the the ruthless authority figure, right? The only good he ever does is is getting rid of himself, removing himself from yeah. the board, so that no one creating the situation. However, even that really doesn't do much because the situation is still yeah. there. They're just no longer a part yeah. of the problem. And I suppose, in a way, like if we were to look at that as like models of human behavior, how are, how do we do things? How do we be better? Um, be kind. Be kind is a yeah. simple one. If you find that you are in fact the villain if you find out that you are a ruthless servant of authority and that you've been oppressing stop like there is nothing stopping you from stopping except your own fears just don't do it um i mean another quote from the book to love another person is to see the face of god yeah and i guess uh you know when you see a place you can do good try to do it and don't mm-hmm. ignore the plight of others. And I think that's about it. Yeah, I think so. All right. Well, um, thanks for listening. Uh, get out there and do yeah. some good. Uh, I'm Melody Wheeler. 
And I'm Mike Toussaint. And this is episode seven, or you were listening to episode seven <laughs> of Free the Mythology, Les Miserables. Bye. Bye.